But Jesus also has extra layers which are there for those who already know the scriptures. Okay. So for instance, the high point of Jesus' story, the dramatic high point, is when the father runs, embraces and kisses the younger son. Now, if you're a scribe, that you actually are used to, to counting phrases. That was part of the thing that they do to differentiate one phrase from another, make sure they copied the right thing. And you know there's only one place in the Old Testament where someone runs, embraces and kisses someone. And that's Esau running and embracing and kissing Jacob. Welcome to Conversations with Tyndale House Scholars in America. We're excited to have Dr. Peter J. Williams, principal of Tyndale House, as our guest today. Peter will discuss his newly published book, The Surprising Genius of Jesus. What is surprisingly genius about Jesus? Stay tuned as Dr. Williams illuminates the exceptional mastery of Jesus' communication in the account of the prodigal son. You can listen to all previous content by visiting our website, at friendsoftendalehouse.com. And now, let's join the conversation. Hello everyone, my name is George Davis. I'm a pastor in Hershey, Pennsylvania, uh, but today I'm here at Tyndall House in Cambridge, England, with Dr. Peter Williams, who is principal of Tyndall House, and we're gonna spend the next few moments talking about Peter's latest book. So first of all, Pete, thanks for the time and congratulations on your new book. And let's begin by, by, by talking about the title of the book. It's an mm -hmm. intriguing title. Uh -huh. The book is entitled, The Surprising Genius of Jesus. Now with that title, you seem to be implying that there are certain things about Jesus we may be missing. So yeah. what are they? What are we missing about Jesus? Well, I think often we think of uh, Jesus as clever because he's the son of God. Okay. And we know that well, he must therefore logically be, be clever. Um, but the thought that there's actually signs, evidence of that genius uh, in the way that he teaches, I think, yes, yeah, certainly people see him as smart, uh, but actual measurable genius, I don't think people have, have thought that we can um, study his words such that we'd be able to show that. Well, as you unpack that idea, uh, one of the things you do is give careful treatment of the parable of the two sons in Luke chapter mm -hmm. 15. And mm -hmm. you argue that there really is uh, the evidence of multiple layers of, of meaning and significance, including Old Testament allusions. So give us some examples of that. Well, yeah, so it's, it's a really clever story, often known as the parable of the prodigal son. Right. Of course, it's got two sons in it, and it's Jesus' longest story. And it's just under three minutes long as, as we would go through it. So it's a short story. And one of the things is, of course, every single word counts. So that's a brilliant aspect of a story. There's no unnecessary word, uh, but also words do multiple things uh, in that. And that, that's one of the features I, I bring out. But there's also, as it's uh, set in Luke, it, we're told that there are four groups of people listening. There are tax collectors, sinners, uh, Pharisees and scribes. And scribes are people who copy out the scriptures. Sinners, presumably people who've got quite a reputation right. for sin right. <laughs> and probably not so much into the scriptures and Jesus manages to teach these two groups simultaneously so that's already an amazing thing if you can do if I can say mixed ability or mixed background uh, teaching because you can tell a story and he tells a story which will work if you don't know any Old Testament information uh, at all it, it's just an amazingly compelling story about the son going away and uh, it, it goes from culture to culture and the joy of the father is the son comes back. But Jesus also has extra layers which are there for those who already know the scriptures. Okay. So for instance, the high point of Jesus' story, the dramatic high point, is when the father runs, embraces and kisses the younger son. Now if you're a scribe, that you actually are used to, to counting phrases. That was part of the thing that they do to differentiate one phrase from another, make sure they copied the right thing. And you know there's only one place in the Old Testament where someone runs, embraces and kisses someone. And that's Esau running and embracing and kissing Jacob. Now the story of Jacob and Esau is a, a man had two sons, just right. like Jesus' story begins. And the older son uh, is cheated out of the inheritance by the younger son. 
The older brother is therefore really angry and Jacob has to go off to a far country where he feeds animals and now he's coming back and it's at that point when he's coming back he actually is fearful for his life because he's heard that Esau's got 400 armed men and is coming towards him. He divides his family into different camps for sort of contingency planning, uh, make sure they don't all get uh, uh, killed instantly and then the shocking thing is that this brother who's quite a bad guy in the Old Testament, Esau, um, has so forgiven his brother that's cheated him out of everything that he's running, embracing and kissing him. And Jesus uses that thing for um, addressing uh, his audience of scribes and the scribes who know the Bible. It, it's quite a firm point that it makes to them in terms of uh, their need to forgive. So what, what do you think he was doing with these Old Testament allusions? So... I, I think there are many elements. One is he's appealing to uh, these uh, uh, people. Uh, so there's also um, the father runs. Well, if you're a scribe, you know there's only one other old man in the right. Bible who runs, and that's Abraham who runs to welcome guests in Genesis chapter 18. The very first words from Abraham's mouth are the word quick. That's also the first word from the father's mouth. So all, And it's all about going to get a fatted calf. So it all matches up with Genesis. And Jesus is making points from the book of Genesis. So Abraham's welcoming strangers, Esau's forgiving the brother who um, stole everything <laughs> from him or cheated him out of his inheritance. But also he's showing his own genius. For those who have ears to hear, for those who are prepared to um, consider seriously what he's saying, if you're a scribe, you should realise this is an amazing teacher. This is someone who knows more than anyone we've ever come across um, because, and we need to take that seriously. And I think there are other stories from the book of Genesis that are reflected in it. Um, the story of Cain and Abel is, of course, a man had two sons. That's, right. that's how it begins. And you think, well, yeah, Adam had two sons initially and one, the older brother, is envious about the acceptance of the younger brother and is very angry and God reasons with him just as the father in Jesus' story reasons. So I think the, these are the ways that Jesus' story is reflecting Old Testament stories. Well, I, th I think you, you've you given us some solid evidence that there is genius behind this mm -hmm. story. But what would you say to those people who would argue, yes, there's a genius here, but it doesn't necessarily go back to Jesus? So there, there are quite a number of things we can do. So I, I do some ana analysis of the story and you see the same storytelling method uh, in Luke as you do in Matthew's gospel. So uh, to say, for instance, Luke or someone writing Luke's gospel, someone else has invented the story, that doesn't explain why you've got what you've got in right. Matthew's okay. gospel, where there's another story that begins, a man had two sons. And again, it's about a reversal that happens um, in that. Um, also, you can find very clever stories um, in, in Mark, in John, uh, in Matthew, things that aren't in Luke. So you've got to think, how many geniuses are we going to say that okay. there were? And you can make each of the gospel writers geniuses, but it won't really explain things anything like as well as saying that the founder of Christianity, Jesus Christ himself, is the really <laughs> clever one who came up with these things. And I think you, you can look at just sayings that people use today the truth will set you free or those who live by the sword will die by the sword judge not you be not judged do unto others what you'd have them do to you um all these sorts of sayings render to caesar the things that are caesar's and to god the things that are god's that have become really major sayings in our culture we might even call them memes <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they're all attributed to jesus uh, and the simplest explanation is that jesus came up with them all uh, not that well, there was one genius that came up with a few and another one that came up with others. So ultimately, how do, how do you explain the genius of Jesus? So, well, Jesus is the son of God. He's the word incarnate. He is uh, the one who invented the world. He invented language. Uh, so why shouldn't he know everything? But of course, there's also this thing that we're told twice in Luke's gospel early on in Jesus' life, uh, when he's a child or a baby, talks about him growing in wisdom, which is a fascinating thing. Because what's that showing us is that even though um, he is the son of God, through the incarnation, uh, he takes on our weaknesses and he, um, let's say, limits access 
to the information he, he can know everything right. uh, but he, he limits that uh, access um, uh, for uh, to identify with us and he has to go through the process of learning things and that's where I think he doesn't just have a shortcut to amazing Bible okay. knowledge. Actually, he studies the scriptures. That's why when he's age 12, he goes to the temple, stays in the temple. <laughs> Parents are looking for him. Right. Uh, but he, he, he goes there and he's asking the experts there in the temple the questions uh, because he's going through that process of learning. And so we can actually think uh, that he can be a model for us in terms of us learning. Well, let me just ask you a more personal question. Mm -hmm. So as you studied the writings of the Gospels, the teachings of Jesus, how have you been affected personally? Well, it, it's very moving just to see um, the depth in the scriptures, to see that every single word counts. That makes me want to take them even more seriously. Um, and uh, God's faithfulness uh, in all of this. I mean, there's a beauty in the story of these two sons, that um, there's joy over the return of the younger son, but you also know there would be joy over the return of the older son. Uh, that's already implied right. in the in the run-up stories, um, because the, the the story before, well, there's the story of a lost sheep uh, that's lost going away, as a lost coin lost at home. There's joy when both of them are found. So you know there'll be joy when this older son who's been at home the whole time um, is. If, if he returns. And I think it speaks to us in whatever situation we are, whether we feel loaded down with our sin, we can return to our loving father um, and uh, he will embrace us. Or if we feel puffed up by our own uh, achievements, uh, we need to humble ourselves and uh, before uh, the loving father. And again, there will be joy. And I think that just speaks to us in every, every situation. It really, it really shows us there are a variety of ways in which we can be lost, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Well, your, your work really is, is an example of the scholarship that's going on here at mm -hmm. Tyndall House. So give us an update about this place. Well, so Tyndall House in uh, you know, Cambridge, England, uh, is continuing to uh, build a community of people who want to be faithful Bible scholars in the service of the church. So our aim is to equip people with really high level understanding of the scriptures, their original culture, their language, and then to go and serve God throughout the world. So uh, we do have uh, people here um, from all around the world. We've got uh, someone from uh, Myanmar uh, here at the moment who's uh, studying. We um, have uh, um, recently people from Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, we are working on uh, having uh, more people from South America. We've got some Brazilians about to arrive. So um, we're trying to make sure every part of, of, of uh, God's churches is equipped with uh, servant-hearted, uh, faithful scholars. Well, again, I want to thank you for your leadership of Tyndale House and also thank you for this new book. And for those of you joining us, thank you for your support of Tyndale House because it's your support that makes scholarship like this possible. Thank you. My name is Peter Williams, Principal of Tyndale House in Cambridge. Thank you very much for watching this video of conversations with Tyndale House scholars in America. And thank you also for sharing this because sharing a video like this helps spread the impact. Tyndale House exists to raise up Bible scholars who are servant-hearted and now are looking to help the church globally. So if you can like this uh, or share it with others, that would be very helpful. Thank you also for your support of Tyndale House and do visit the website friendsoftyndalehouse.com.